We imagine so easily that Christianity is the religion of do, but actually Christianity, it is the message of done. Jesus did everything needed to bring us to the Father when he died on that cross. And so he invites us to come to him and to have our burden lifted as we trust in him and then to know true rest. Welcome to Encounter the Truth with Jonathan Griffiths. I'm Steve Hiller, and uh, Jonathan, so good to be reminded that all that is needed to be right with God has already been accomplished. Jesus did it all on the cross. Nothing that we can do to make us right with God. It really begins and ends with being in that relationship with Jesus. This is such a vital truth to understand and to internalize the human instinct to strive to make ourselves right with God, to impress Him and to please Him with good works, with moral works. It's such a strong instinct. And if we are to come to Christ, we need to overcome that instinct. We need to unlearn that lesson of the human heart and recognize there is nothing we can do to save ourselves. There, there is no amount of good works that we can do that will right the wrong of our hearts before God and to render us worthy of his kingdom. We, we need to come to God on the basis of the finished work of Jesus Christ. That's the only way to come, and that's the only hope for the human heart. Well, we're going to continue to look at this today as we open our Bibles together. Matthew chapter 11 is where we're at, looking at verses 25 to 30. Join us there as we continue. Rest for the weary soul. Here is Jonathan. I wonder if you've ever had the opportunity to meet a really powerful person, maybe a senior figure in government, the prime minister or a president, the CEO of a big company, a famous cultural leader, an actor, an author, someone like that. If we do have occasion to meet such a person, I think most of us might feel just a little bit nervous. Will this person who exercises such power, such influence, economic, political, cultural, will, will this person frankly be nice and approachable? Will it be okay talking to them? Should I be scared or should I at least be on my guard? I remember quite clearly having to go in and see the headmaster at my school when I was 12 or 13. I, I knew this man from a distance, a, a Scotsman, uh, always immaculately turned out in his suit, certainly old-fashioned, maybe a little bit austere. I knew him from afar, speaking in the school assembly and so on, but I'd never had a one-on-one -on -one meeting with him. I wasn't in trouble, but I had this appointment, and I remember the nervousness as I waited outside his office. In my little world, this was just about the most powerful person there was. But I discovered, soon into the meeting, and the impression has lasted until this day, I discovered what a gracious and a kind person he was. I now know that this was his widespread reputation. He was well-loved for his gentleness and his kindness, but it was such a relief. It was such a happy discovery. Jesus has just shown us his great authority. The crowds might have thought him powerless, but no, their failure to respond, it, it reflects the Father's will and Jesus' own choice. And so now we might wonder, having understood that, we might wonder if Jesus is actually approachable at all. He's clearly powerful. He's clearly willing to exercise discerning judgments as he engages with people. And so we might now ask, can anyone approach Jesus? Is it safe to do so? Well, off the back of these clarifying statements about his own authority, Jesus now issues perhaps the warmest invitation of all the Scripture. And the words are familiar as they are beautiful. Verse 28, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. There are plenty of people who refuse to come to Jesus, who dismiss his claims and reject his words, but the invitation, it's there for all, for anyone who will receive it to come to him. His invitation in particular is for all who labor and are heavy laden. 
In using that particular language, Jesus did, I think, have especially in mind those who were laboring under a burden of legalistic religious requirements. That was a real issue within Israel. The religious leaders and teachers of the day had taken the Old Testament law and added on top of it traditions that extended its requirements for obedience and religious duty. And Jesus has very hard words of criticism for them later in Matthew's gospel. Listen to his assessment of these religious leaders in Matthew 23. This is Matthew 23 and verse 1. The scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat, he says. So do and observe whatever they tell you, but do not do the works they do. For they preach, but they do not practice. They tie up heavy burdens hard to bear, and lay them on people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to move them with their finger. These hypocritical religious leaders specialize in tying up heavy burdens, legalistic requirements beyond what God Himself has asked, and they delight in laying them on the shoulders of others. Now, listening to those words here in Matthew 23, we can only imagine that Jesus has these kinds of legalistic religious burdens in mind when he issues his invitation. That's the background. But at the same time, the invitation here is stated broadly, and I think it's meant to be broad. I think the implication is very wide. Whoever is wearied and burdened, whether it be with legalistic demands, whether it be with a sense of needing to try to work to please God, whether it be with a burden of guilt on the conscience, whether it be with the sheer griefs and trials of life, whoever is weary and heavy laden, come to me, says Jesus. On one level, the weary and the heavy laden must be identified closely with the little children of verse 26, those who come to God not to offer Him something in their wisdom and insight, but who come to Him with empty hands and heavy burdens, ready to receive what He would give. What does Jesus offer to those who come to Him on such terms? Well, He offers rest. Rest is one of the great Bible words associated with salvation. It is the goal of God's creative and redemptive plans. It is rest in this life and rest in the life to come. It means to be at peace with God and to enter into the fullness of relationship with Him. It means to have nothing left to do in order to please God and to be right with Him. In this life, the follower of Jesus enters rest in terms of entering into the security of being right with God and knowing you're right with God, totally at peace with Him. In the life to come, the experience of rest, it deepens and it expands as we enter the place of eternal rest in God's presence above. The idea of entering God's rest in this life and the life to come, it's a wonderful prospect. But we mustn't misunderstand it to think that it means that in following Jesus, we become inactive and, and passive, that He has nothing for us to do in His service, nothing for us to obey in living as His disciples and His people. No, we set aside the burdens of life on our own, the burdens that others would place on us, and we instead, we take on the yoke of Jesus Christ, verse 29. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. A yoke is a frame put on animals, perhaps two oxen, to bind them together in service and in labor. And Jesus, He does place His yoke upon us. We, we do belong to Him if we would follow Him. And, and bearing His yoke, it means heeding His word. It means, as he says here, learning from him. Now, on one level, that could sound rather unappealing, giving up one burden to receive another burden. But Jesus gives us very good reason to take up his yoke as opposed to any other. And his reason, it's a compelling one. For I am gentle and lowly of heart, says Jesus. Now, friends, I do want to pause here. I want to consider this carefully because even though these words are familiar, these are some of the most familiar words actually in all of the Bible, 
Although they're familiar, I'm not convinced that we really believe that they are true. You're listening to Encounter the Truth with Jonathan Griffiths and a message called Rest for the Weary Soul. It's part of a larger series called Living as Kingdom People. Now, we're going to pause right here, but we'll get back to this message from Matthew chapter 11 in just a few moments. I hope you'll stay with us. Well, Encounter the Truth is a listener-supported ministry. We're able to be on the station because of your generosity. It is truly your giving that allows us to cover things like production costs and airtime and all the things that happen behind the scenes. But as you give a gift of any amount this month, we want to say thank you by sending you The Four Emotions of Christmas. It's a book written by Bob Lapine. And in this book, he addresses how we often expect Christmas to be a season filled with magic. And yet so often we experience disappointment when our deepest longings go unfulfilled. Our loneliness and our sadness, they're only amplified because of how to sync they are with what the season promises. We'd love to send you a copy of this book as our way of saying thank you for your financial support. You can find out more or give online by coming to EncounterTheTruth.org. You can also call us at 833-99-TRUTH. That's 1-833-998-7884 or EncounterTheTruth.org. Back to the message. Here's Jonathan. It's always a significant moment when someone opens up and tells you something about their personality, what they're really like inside, and sometimes a person will tell you something about themselves, and it will just come as a little bit of a surprise. You won't have anticipated that. A number of times I've, I've talked with pastors, and they'll say to me, you know, my personality is such that I'm, I'm a bit of an introvert, naturally. And that's very interesting, you know, because you see someone in public uh, preaching and speaking and so on, and to think that actually they're a real introvert, that doesn't, that doesn't seem to fit too well. That doesn't immediately make sense. But the person knows himself, and it, it turns out that, yes, this is true. That's an accurate self-assessment. Jesus has just told us of the authority that he has as the Son of the Father, authority to reveal truth. He has spoken earlier in this chapter of the judgment that will come to those who do not respond rightly to him. But now he gives us another insight into his personality and into his character, an insight that might seem initially surprising to us, and we need to sit up and to take note. This sovereign son of heaven above, with all knowledge and all authority given to him, he is gentle and lowly of heart. That's his character. That's what Jesus has to say about himself. But, you know, I do think that you and I are slow to believe it. More than that, I think that if we do come to believe it, we are very slow to live in the good of it. I think we can spend a lot of the Christian life laboring under a sense that we ought to be better and we ought to do more. We can spend a lot of the Christian life, if we're not careful, feeling a little bit judged by other Christians, maybe a lot judged sometimes, feeling inadequate, feeling like we're failing, feeling like we're not achieving in the Christian life. And in some ultimate sense, I think we trace those feelings back to how we imagine the Lord is looking on us. And of course, in and of ourselves, we're we're not what we ought to be, and we don't do what we, we ought to do. But we need to understand this. Jesus is gentle, and He is lowly of heart, and He offers us rest for our souls. He places on our back a yoke that is easy and a burden that is light. That's what he tells us here. And yet, despite his very clear words, and there's not a lot of ambiguity here. It's very, very clear, isn't it? Despite his clear words, much of the time, for many of us, frankly, our Christianity feels hard and our burden feels heavy. And I fear that we all too often reinforce that sense of burden for one another in the Christian community. There is, of course, plenty of legalism kicking around the wider Christian world. It's not the same legalism as the Pharisees, but there are plenty of rules and conventions and expectations to be found in different corners of the church. We easily make one another feel just a little inadequate, even a little guilty. We can make one another feel that we're not sharp enough in our convictions or committed enough in our service or godly enough in our our walk, and there can be a terrible sense of burden, failing to measure up, failing to meet expectations. We want to be zealous for the Lord. Of course we do. But if our Christianity does not, at the end of the day, have a real sense of rest 
and release about it of lightness, of burden. If it doesn't have that, something is wrong. If our vision of Jesus, if our understanding of who he is and what he is like is not marked by gentleness and lowliness in a profound way, something in our thinking, friends, has become skewed. The religious leaders of Jesus' day must have thought that they were doing the right thing. Somewhere in their heart and their mind, they must have been convinced that bullying people into rule-keeping was the right thing to do, that it was what God wanted them to do. And wherever legalism and burdensome religious duty creep into the church today, I'm sure those things creep in because folk feel that that's what the Lord wants and that's what he requires, and that's what is right. But it happens fundamentally because there is a skewed vision of who Jesus is, a skewed vision of what he calls us to in discipleship. And friends, the basic bent of the fallen human heart is always toward works-based religion. It is toward that attempt to sort of pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. It is toward seeking divine favor through our own efforts. And we constantly need, because that is our natural bent in sin, we constantly need to course correct within our own hearts, through the Word of God, by the power of of the Spirit. And we need to do that personally. We need to do that corporately as the people of God. And we need to learn and learn again that Jesus calls us in a profound and fundamental way to rest from all that to lay down that yoke of oppression that says, I must do such and such to make myself acceptable to God. We need to learn afresh that Jesus really means it when he says that his yoke is easy and his burden is light. He really came to free us from any sense that we need to do anything to earn God's favor. He really came to lift off our back the burden of guilt that we so easily carry, that burden that can be so crushingly heavy. And he came to place on our back a yoke of discipleship that is a joy to carry because it is light. It is marked in a fundamental way by true spiritual rest. Friends, I just long for us to really believe that and to delight in it and to live in the good of it. Sometimes presentations of Christianity and of the Christian life can be just a little bit miserable, I think, burdensome, legalistic, but that's just so unlike biblical Christianity. It's such a skewed presentation of who Jesus is. And so I want each one of us to reflect on this and see where our vision of Jesus and of the Christian life needs to be readjusted today in light of Jesus' own words. For those who are exploring, who are considering the faith, and I hope there are a number listening, I wonder how these words of Jesus reshape your conception of him and of what it would mean to be a Christian. You see, it's entirely possible, maybe even likely, that you have a conception of Christianity in your mind that basically presents Jesus Christ as an enforcer of rules and of discipline and the Christian life as essentially a huge burden of obligation to carry around. But how different is the reality? Jesus says to us, he says to you, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. We imagine so easily that Christianity is the religion of do, do this and do that, you better do it. But actually, Christianity, it is the message of done. Jesus did everything needed to bring us to the Father when he died on that cross at Calvary. And so he invites us to come to him 
and to have our burden lifted as we trust in him and then to know true rest. Have you encountered this Jesus, the real Jesus, the Jesus who is gentle and lowly of heart? And let me ask you, would you respond to his invitation? (laughs) And would you do so even today? Maybe your burden is heavy. Maybe you're feeling that in a very profound way today, your burden of sin and of guilt, your burden of trying to be good enough and knowing you just can't be good enough. Would you come to Jesus? Would you come to him that he might lift that burden off your back? Would you come to him that he might extend to you the forgiveness of sin through his death on the cross? Would you come to him that you might enter into his promised rest? Would you do that? even today. I'm so conscious that many believers fail to enjoy the rest that is ours in Christ. I'm so conscious that many, many listening today, I am quite sure, labor under this sense of not being enough, not doing enough, not measuring up, labor under this sense of spiritual inadequacy. I think that's very, very common. And I think it's compounded by the well-meaning but profoundly misguided words and actions of other believers who can add burden and expectation and guilt unknowingly, unintentionally often, but who pile on spoken and unspoken requirements for how to live the Christian life. And if that's what you're grappling with today, if you're carrying a burden of expectation and guilt in the Christian life, would you please lay it down today? Would you, in a fresh way, lay that burden at the feet of Jesus and receive his rest? I hope you will. I I hope you'll do that even today. I hope you will know rest in Jesus and the lightness of burden as you follow him and learn from him, heeding his word day by day. Jesus Christ, he is heaven's son, the one of true authority, sovereign authority, who is not rejected or accepted on the whim of the people, but within his own sovereign power and choice. But this all-powerful Jesus, he is gentle and lowly of heart. And it is our privilege, friends, it is our joy to know him, to follow him, to learn from him, Let's rejoice in that privilege. This is Encounter the Truth with Jonathan Griffiths. As we wrap up our message today, rest for the weary soul. And if you've missed any part of today's broadcast or you want to go back and listen to previous broadcasts in the series you may have missed, you can always do that at our website. Just come to EncounterTheTruth.org. Well, Encounter the Truth is listener-supported. That's exactly what it sounds like. We depend on your generosity and your financial support to keep this program going. But as you give a gift of any amount this month, we want to say thank you by sending you a book written by Bob Lapine. It's called The Four Emotions of Christmas. And Jonathan, how would you encourage those who listen and give to use this book when they receive it? Well, I think Christmas is just the most wonderful opportunity to share the hope that we have in Christ with those around us, with our our friends and loved ones, with our co-workers, with our neighbors. And it's often helpful to have a resource to share with folk at Christmas. And I want to commend to you this resource. We're trusting that it'll be helpful to you as you seek to share the good news of Jesus Christ this Christmas with those around you. And I think one of the great strengths of this little book is the fact that it connects with people people's emotional realities, where they're at. We know that Christmas is often an emotionally complex time, and this little book engages with those realities and points us to the Lord Jesus Christ to find hope and joy in Him at Christmas. And I trust you'll be able to use this and give it away that others will find joy and hope in Christ this year. Well, we want to send you a copy of this book, The Four Emotions of Christmas, as our way of saying thank you for your financial support. You can give over the phone by calling us at 833-998-7884. That's 833-99-TRUTH. Or go online and give through our website. It's EncounterTheTruth.org. That's EncounterTheTruth.org. For Jonathan Griffiths, I'm Steve Hiller. Thanks for listening, and I hope you'll join us next time.